and welcome to Unwarranted Music Opinions, the show in which three music dorks all choose an album and then we listen to them all for over the course of the week and reconvene to discuss our opinions on our respective picks. I am June Lindbergh here with Bumble Crumbly. That's not my name. And Shaw Jeffries. Oof. <laughs> And this is a regular episode, Anything Goes, and we have a very varied group of albums to talk about today. And we are going to kick it off with Chaz's pick. So the album I picked is by the Canadian girl rock band Plum Tree. Can we just, can we just, can we just, can, we just, can I just, can I just, can I just, girl rock is not a genre. <laughs> It kind of no, is. It is. I no, I think I disagree. I Hard to disagree. The Riot Movement. Right. It's not a Riot Girl album, though. I mean, it, it sounds kind of like Sleater Kenny. But Girl Rock is somewhere. Girl Rock is the in between. It's between Riot and. I'm not even and saying, not even saying that's a female. genre. They're literally an all girl rock band. Big Head. <laughs> big Head. I love Big Head so much. <laughs> yeah, Big Head. <laughs> anyway. Head ass. <laughs> Anyway, Fuck you. <laughs> I picked their 1997 album, Predicts the Future. Kind of underground. Not a lot of people know of them. They kind of have some, like they're known in some circles. Their biggest thing is that they inspired the classic graphic novel series, Scott Pilgrim, with their song, Scott Pilgrim, that's on this album that we're going to be talking about. Just to get out of the way, fucking adore Scott Pilgrim. Love the movie. Love the graphic novel series. It's one of my like favorite pieces of media of all time. I love this album uh, and this group. I discovered them through the movie because at some point in a certain scene, Scott Pilgrim, the character played by Michael Sarah, is wearing a plum tree shirt and two of their songs, Go and the song Scott Pilgrim, are used in the movie. So I kind of already knew about them and then I picked up the album to listen to and loved it. For me... I listened to it a lot in late middle school, early high school. It was kind of a, what I call an old reliable. It wasn't something I'd put on all the time, but when I was just in the mood for it, it was always something I could go to. This album is a lot of fun. Great guitar work, catchy harmonies, great fun vocals, punchy production. It's just an overall fun album. It's not really breaking any boundaries. It's not doing something new. It's just taking a well-known formula and doing it well. Like I said, this isn't one of my favorite albums of all time. It's just one I think would be fun to talk about for the show. What do you guys think? So for me, sonically, this winds up somewhere in between Tiger Trap and Sleater Kenny. Definitely has this sort of twee pop roughness to it. This indie, 90s indie. It's so 90s. Yes, this very. It's like as 90s indie rock with some of that twee pop harmonies and a little bit of that indie pop in there, but it also isn't afraid to get a little rough sometimes, uh, closer to Riot Girl, which you mentioned, and something just a little punkier, a little grittier, like Sleater Kenny. Not to say that this album is particularly punky or gritty, it's mostly just very accessible, very melodic tunes that are played with a lot of personality and a lot of attitude. For me, this is a genre that I think when we mentioned doing this album last week or whenever we recorded the last episode, I thought this was potentially going to be June core. I was like, okay, this seems something that's completely right up my alley. And honestly, it is like this is a sound that I am extremely familiar with. I love a lot of bands that work in this style. So listening to this album, it was like, yeah, I know what I'm expecting here. And I got what I expected. It didn't blow my mind or anything, but it was, as you said, just a fun record. A lot of really catchy hooks, a lot of very melodic guitar lines. The whole thing has this, not lo-fi, but just ramshackle aesthetic that feels to me like it... I mean, it was released on a... Hold on, was this even released on a record label? I looked into this too. I can't remember off the top of my head, but I was curious about it. I think Discogs is a good place to check where things were released on. It feels authentically indie, I should say. It, uh -huh. The way that it's recorded, the roughness of the recording and the performances, it definitely feels like this is something they came up with in their garage or something like that, which I really, really like. And I especially like it when it's an all-female band 
doing that kind of like it's just right up my alley that's the kind of thing that i love to hear some of my favorite tracks usually the tracks that are my favorite on this record just have better melodies there's not a whole lot of variation in the instrumentation or in the structure racing gloves fn fatherhood scott pilgrim going so low is a really nice change of pace too with that little slide guitar it was a more of a slow ballad type of track and i love the high notes on the chorus and the vocal harmonies a lot of very tiger trap-esque vocal harmonies going on on this album yeah this was a a, a fun record easy listen i had a lot of fun with it i got a lot of love for this thing to be honest i think a lot of the grooves come off pretty boneless to me just because the bass is tends to be a little bit lower in the mix and I don't really enjoy that about it because I don't find the grooves to be that strong anyway. So I was, you know, looking for maybe a good mix to kind of make the instruments pop, and they just really don't. I mean, yeah, it does have a little bit of roughness to it. Not that I mind that. That's, I guess, a quality that I could take or leave about the album. I think the songwriting is what makes me suffer the most on this thing. Not suffer, but I just dislike it the most. Like, there, it's, I think a lot of it's okay, and it's only really bad twice. Like, that's really how I feel about it. When's it bad? Uh, my least favorite songs are probably Scott Pilgrim is one of my least favorite songs that we oh, had. Oh, that's a cl- the that's show. like their most classic tune. That is. I just don't like the, the refrain is annoying about ten seconds in, and then it goes on for like two more minutes, and I just I just can't stand it. I don't I don't like the groove either. I think the groove is just really rigid and isn't like as tuneful and playful as the song is trying to come off for me. That's what makes it annoying. I like the change of Fatherhood, the game's over, and Going Solo are probably my favorite tracks. I like the variation on Fatherhood and Game's Over, where they're kind of going between two different time signatures, basically. You know, kind of, and I don't want to make it sound like it's mathy or some shit, but it, you know, they're just going to, between two different parts, kind of makes the song dynamic and stand out in the track list, which, like you said, doesn't have a lot of variation, so I'm not super into it. I don't really like the intro track at all. Oh, fuck you. Do that is the best. Is, oh, fuck you. <laughs> It just doesn't do anything to get me interested. That is such Lyrically, a, a couple of the songs have a few standout moments, but nothing to write home about for me personally. So when I can think of one word to sum up how I feel about this album, I think just inoffensive. Wow. Wow. Okay. All right. I agree with a lot of your guys' complaints. Songwriting-wise, I think it's very one note. It's very basic. I think that's kind of the point. It's just I don't fun. Mind. It's just fun, punchy oh, wow. rock. However, what makes this album stand out for me is the guitar work, the solos. The lead work on this thing is undeniably great. From Go, from Scott Pilgrim, from uh, Hang Up Baby, from Fatherhood, you've got some bangers when it comes to lead work. Yeah, I agree, June. When it's all girls, it's just awesome. Like, there's just something badass about this group, this Canadian all-girl indie rock group. I love the harmonies. I love the production on this thing. It's very punchy and fun. And I disagree. I think you're able to hear everything well, Brian. I can hear bass on this for me personally. I can hear it. It's just low. Because you've got, you've got one really guitar on awesome. the right, one guitar on the left, and you've got the drums and bass in the back backing everything up, and then you've got the vocals right in the front. It's very well mixed, but it still kind of has that low fineness to it that gives it some grit that I think it needs because the guitars sound awesome on this thing. I should mention, uh, along with the, what you were talking about with them being an all-girl band, that tends to just be an aesthetic that I really, really connect with, mm-hmm. especially out of like the 90s and 80s, like a, an all-girl rock band that is just doing their own thing. I wrote on uh, my notes here for the song Fatherhood, uh, I wrote that it makes me want to jump around in a skirt with my 90s flannel lesbian girlfriend. Yeah. Like, that's just the vibe that I get this entire album. That's just kind of the feeling that I get from bands like Sleater Kenny and Tiger Trap and all that. And this just fits right in. Right. With those. Here's the thing. Brian, you are a smooth brain if you don't think Go is a great song. That is such a great <laughs> opener. One of the best album openers I've yet, like, you know, My Name is Jonas go like those are just some classic album openers for me from my childhood and (laughs) (laughs) brian's face i just i love the countdown i love the solo at the end it's so fucking fire and just the girls yell well well awesome love it i kind of think it's hilarious that 
amongst the three of us, we each have different favorite songs. We have like a few similarities. Uh, my favorite songs are Go, Scott Pilgrim, Hang Up Baby, and Fatherhood. <laughs> Hang Up Baby doesn't get a lot of love because that harmony is amazing and it's super that actually catchy. Is one of the better, that's one of the better choruses on the record too. For super sure. catchy in harmony and very memorable. I think the back half is a little the forgettable. The back half. The back half's better for me. You I think like so? the back half a little bit more. I don't know. I, think I feel like Fatherhood Games Over. That's where all my my songs I like the most are. The Games Over, Fatherhood, and Going Solo. Those are you know those are my favorite songs all in the back half. But I do agree with Hang Up Baby being one of the probably the best one on the A side basically. Mm-hmm. I don't know. For me, what makes this album so good for me is the consistency. It's just from front to back, fun, punchy. These girls know how to rock. The solo work keeps me grounded. The harmonies are super fun. The biggest issue I have that we haven't really talked about is lyrically, the sound's kind of lacking. I just think... Yeah, it's not very deep or detailed. Like, a lot of these songs are like, do you even really know what you're talking about? I feel like a lot of the lyrics are just... Charna! <laughs> I just feel like a lot of the lyrics here are just placeholders. Like, the main thing you come to the sound for is the instrumentation. And the lyrics are just kind of placeholders for the harmonies to add to the instrumentation. Like, the only song that even has any lyrical substance for me is Fatherhood. I feel like there's some actual real depth there that's worth looking into. Even back in the day when I would listen to this, I never came for it for the lyrics. Like, it was never a lyrical album that I came to. And I think that brings it back. The lyrics aren't. They're not bad. They're not bad. They're just so. Right? They're not nearly on the level as something like Diet Sig. Uh... <laughs> But they they just don't. Hey, that's coming. Don't to. talk too much shit. That's coming. God. That oh, geez. it's coming. <laughs> so overall, this record for me, it's like a decent seven, decent to strong seven. Uh, it's you basically had my taste down when you were like, this. I think June's gonna like this. It's like yeah, of course I'm gonna like this. Early indie rock, like eighties, nineties indie rock, all girl bands, just kind of rough and ramshackle like that's just an aesthetic that i absolutely adore so it's gonna be a solid record for me regardless and there are like you said there's some good instrumental performances here there's some very catchy and fun songwriting strong five oh fuck you brian strong five i just uh, don't really uh, feel it's mostly positive i don't really feel strongly one way or the other it's not bad though it's not the worst thing we listen to for the show it's not my favorite thing i just totally don't <laughs> care <laughs> i'm feeling a light eight on predicts the future by plum tree it's a look at it's, that light that little delicate little yeah feathery eight it's an old reliable Realistically, it's probably more in a seven range. However, it's bumped up a little bit because of some nostalgia goggles on this one. And it helped produce one of my favorite pieces of media, the Scott Pilgrim graphic novel series and movie. So, you know, if that's the album I have to thank for that, I'm going to give them a little uh, little love there. But I do think it's an album worth listening to. It's a lot of fun. And I think Plum Tree in general deserves more love. They're just a fun Canadian girl rock band from the 90s that... I don't think got enough appreciation than what they did. But uh, yeah, I think a light eight. So the album that I chose was the 1974 release Jolene by everybody's favorite human being, Dolly Parton. Facts in the uh, chat. Dolly Parton is just one of these unilateral, nobody can dislike her people. She's just so wholesome and kind and good and everybody's heard jolene it says here well, she murdered well. her husband Quick well, search. God damn it. you're just throwing me off with your nonsense everybody's heard the song jolene basically everybody loves the song jolene but when i heard this record i realized that there is absolutely way more to dolly parton's music than just the song jolene especially on this record there are some absolutely fantastic Nashville styled country songs on this thing with beautiful instrumentation, wonderful vocals, very, very melodic songwriting. So I figured that you, this would be worth talking about because even among country music fans, people will talk about Redheaded Stranger by Willie Nelson or Johnny Cash uh, live at Folsom or even John Prine, who I think is 
underappreciated in his own right. People will bring up his debut as some of the best country records of all time, but I don't see much appreciation for this Dolly Parton LP. I see a lot of appreciation for her as a person and Jolene, but I figured this would be good to talk about in that regard. This album is fucking awesome. It's 24 minutes of just crisp, fun Nashville country. I think lyrically, it's solid across the board. Jolene is a fucking banger. Probably... It is! God! Probably the best song on the album. However, my favorite song is a highlight of my life. Could listen yes! to that. Yes! Yes! Yeah! <laughs> could listen to that. I knew you'd pull through for me, dude. I knew you would. I could listen to that all day. I knew you would come through at some point, man. I knew you'd stop fucking up <laughs> and you would come through with some fucking bass take like that. <laughs> yeah, dude. It is. A lot it of these is. songs, no longer than two and a half minutes, like not even one and a half. Longest song in here is like three something minutes. It is just consistent front to back with some gorgeous vocals from Dolly Parton. Excellent songwriting. Nearly like every other song is catchy as hell. I love the production. It's that classic 70s production. Like you said, Plum Tree is super 90s. This is super 70s. This is super 70s. And it's amazing. Yes. Uh, I love the instrumentation, the violins, the banjos, the acoustic guitars. Solid as hell. What the biggest Come on, thing, Chaz, they're not violins, they're fiddles. Uh, fake fan. Fiddles, my Gotta friend. Gotta get it right. Sorry, fiddles. The fuck out. <laughs> I think Sorry. the biggest selling point for this album, though, is Dolly Parton singing. It, it is! God! I mean, I'm literally gonna have nothing to talk about. <laughs> You're just gonna make all my points for me. <laughs> like, her singing is gorgeous. Like, you're right, June. Everybody talks about what a great person she is. But is anybody really talking about how good of a fucking singer she is, though? Like, where I, is the yeah. praise? It's not I see praise for Jolene, but not... Like, I feel like people mention country artists and, and Dolly Parton will come up. And Jolene will come up and people will mention that track. But I, I just listening to this album, I was like, this is just front to back fantastic. And I don't really see... Like, it has some level of appreciation, but like... If people who were fan of Graham Parsons and his records, which I think are fantastic, listen to some of Dolly's records from around the same time, I think they're basically equal in quality. And I, I think that for me personally, Jolene might have an edge out on Graham Parsons. Seriously, it's fantastic. Like if I had to come up with a complaint, maybe it is too short, but I've never really understood the complaints for short albums. If you want more, just listen to more of her records. Like, that's all you got to do. And she's the, got... The 40-minute record is not a format born out of, like, that's just how records... Are. Like, that is born out of that's what sell. You know, they're just... A lot of times, artists would just fill out those LPs. Like, they're just filling 40 minutes with songs that, you know... And you sometimes you get lucky with, like... You know, like the Doors debut, a lot of those songs sound similar, but, the, you know, they're all amazing songs. And But a lot of the time they're just filling out for, you know, this is very right. much like, here's what we wrote. Here's what we got for the record. Here's the record like that. And yeah. that's how it should be written. You don't, you know. But Absolutely. The, I think Jolene is too strong of an opening, though. Like, holy crap. That song just. No way. Right the, out of the, I love it, the dissonant strings. The it's dissonant so, strings no, no, that, right. that are like. You misunderstand my point. In the background. You misunderstand my point. It is a fan fucking tastic song. However, it starts off, the album starts off way too strong because I don't think even though I love a lot of the <laughs> tunes, they don't live up to Jolene because Jolene's the best song. I think they do. Ooh, I, I think, think there's a couple of tracks do. that actually are. I mean, highlight of my better. life is the highlight of the album for me. Early morning breeze. Oh, that's a good one, dude. I love when the I guitar comes the in. I love when yeah, the guitar exactly. and it sounds like surf rock. Like that's awesome. I think Chaz, you're right. Like her voice is the, and they know that, and they put it up front. Like it's, you know, you can hear everything she says clearly, and her singing like is her, just so perfect. Her voice is an instrument, and it is used beautifully for the entire yes, album. Yeah. Not a weak moment with her voice. It's crazy to me that a song as good as Jolene 
whatever song comes after that should be doomed, but it's not. When someone wants to leave is in another like just a great song. Yeah, I like love the I love that this favorite. album isn't stereotypically country in the lyric department. I think a lot of these songs, not a lot of country no, artists. It's just like a love album. There's a lot of country music that has this very I don't know. positive. I feel like Dolly brings her own uh, brings uh, her own spin on some things with some of these topics. She does, and she brings her own just optimism. I think. yes, I feel like you know someone like Dolly Parton. I feel like that's really endearing about some of the songs on here gotta mention i will always love you classic song whitney houston yes. cover is a classic well, yeah, cover yeah and it's i didn't know this original version is one of my favorites I this think, is uh, like favorite iterations of the song well it's interesting to know the actual context of that song it's about a former person she used to play with uh, if i'm correct and it's just a little heartbreaking I don't you, think it matters what it was written about because the meaning of the song is just totally transcended what it was ever about. People, I think you could blame you know, the, the song is about lost love for most people. Well, I think you can blame the Whitney Houston cover for that. I don't think Dolly Parton ever had that in mind when she wrote the song. I think just because of that Whitney Houston cover, the song has well, transcended. I mean, people are always interpreting the art in different ways and whatever they interpret it to be is what it is. I think that's what the song is for a lot of people now is just, you know, this lament for a love lost, but it's a very, you know, it's not like it's a uh, bittersweet. I mean, as she says, it's bittersweet, you know, in the song and that it's just, that's why it's so perfect because it just takes this angle, and right. it, you know, and, and Dolly is just so endearing the way she comes across in this album and her singing is just so good. And the songs are just written so well, like from a lyrical standpoint, yeah, not, not to mention the playing is near perfect on every song here yeah there's not if a... anything lacks on a song it's just the strength of the song doesn't resonate with me but i the instrumentation the singing i love the way the vocals are super up front there's no complaints in that department i just think some songs pale in comparison to others especially as we get towards the last half of the i don't think the record ends super strong i think you have this just killer run up to the song living on memories of you where i think the last three maybe for me aren't as strong as like you know the beginning song to me, early morning blues is, a you know, it's a different kind of moment. But for me, it's just the highlights of my life. I will always love you. The Randy, like those first six or seven tracks are like a near perfect country record right there. You know, I just think the end trails off a little bit in terms of quality. I don't know. I would agree with that, but I still love the songs on the back half of the record. I just love the songs on the front half of the record a bit more. So it doesn't yeah, end up being much agree. of a problem for me, especially mm -hmm. considering... It's never a slog. It's only 24 minutes. That's the thing. No, so the back half isn't yeah. quite as good. It's still gone in like five minutes. Yeah, it doesn't even matter if the front half is better because the album just is so tight and consistent. It's just a breeze to sit through. You don't even really notice yeah. that the back half isn't as strong. But I think she's just so endearing and sweet. I think that's really what it boils down to. I can listen to the instrumentation all day, try to pick apart what different instruments are doing. It's very technical and very technically sound and like under these very beautiful love songs it doesn't necessarily you know you're like well this really work but it does because it kind of gives this optimistic sound to the record too and it's not like super sweet sounding it's just very natural and it just sounds amazing you know it's a classic sound completely so i should mention like i really wanted to talk about dolly parton because i feel like there's just this personal connection that I kind of have with her. Like part of the reason why I really love this album and really love Dolly Parton and John Prine, it just feels like, and especially Dolly Parton, just because of how outspoken she has been about social issues for a long time now and how she's just the epitome of what I appreciate about the South and being a trans woman from the rural South. I know that the region has is behind on a lot of social issues, but listening to people like Dolly Parton makes me feel okay to have at least some amount of, I don't know if pride is the right word. It's not really Southern, Southern identity. Pride. Yes. It makes me feel more comfortable. Southern pride has some connotations. No. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just lets me feel a little more comfortable in that Southern identity. Dolly Parton, John Prine. She, I think she it's perfectly a... exemplifies what, I appreciate about some of the people here while eschewing a lot of the stereotypes about bigotry and close mindedness. It's just like the thing people do to people from other states. I don't know if we talked about it on the show, but you know, it's like sometimes when people are far away and you just talk about them a lot, you forget their people kind of thing. You know, every area is going to have a diverse group of people with different frames of mind. You know, not everyone in the South thinks one way, not everyone in the North thinks one way, West, East. 
uh, right, you know, not and, everyone and, from Wisconsin loves cheese or some stupid shit. Yeah. Well, maybe that's true. <laughs> I don't know if that's true. I just think it's important to understand that if we should stand in solidarity as citizens so that the South can rise again. I think that's oh. really what <laughs> I want people to take away. <laughs> Um, that yeah, Chaz so, looked physically sick. <laughs> Dolly Parton is just fantastic. She's fantastic as a person, and she's fantastic as a musician. And what a good person on this what record. A, what a good album. Read some so fucking listen. books, or Dolly um, Parton will personally come to the window and smack you with an acoustic guitar. Just saying. Read some books. Yeah, Chaz, read some fucking <laughs> articles like that Macklemore song or whatever. I am feeling a light nine. On Jolene. Okay. Uh, strong eight. Again, when it comes to country, I'm still just always a little iffy. But this album is so fucking solid. Like, strong eight. Like, on a good day, it'll it's a light nine for sure. But am I going to come back to this a lot? I, I don't know. Just when it comes to country, I'm very iffy. Maybe you should consider a career. Maybe you should consider a career as a garbage man. Would that help? For me, the best country album... <laughs> I just think it would be appropriate. The best album, country album ever written is still 12 Golden Country Greats. Just, you know, I don't think that'll <laughs> ever, ever be topped. I take it back, Chess. I take it all back. <laughs> I, lo I love Dolly Parton, though. She's a national treasure, and this album just solidifies that. Highlight of my life, I'll be but bumping. But she's not... But she's not ween. She's not ween. She's not ween. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly, dude. Case closed. I don't so. even know where to begin with that take. Oh, God. I mean, I love 12 Golden Country Greats. Don't get me wrong. I don't even know how to approach this. <laughs> oh, well, Jolene by Dolly Parton is a fantastic record. I'm thinking like a strong eight, sometimes a light nine. Exactly. Depending. Yeah. It's um, the perfect not strong not eight album. Is it one of, not only is it one of the best records, just best country records I've heard. I think it's one of the best records of 1974, the year that it came out. Like, it just keeps going up and up in my estimation. And it's so short that, like, when I was first getting into this record, you know, I had it on my Spotify, and, like, every time I drove to work, it was about a 25-minute drive. So I would just listen to Dolly Parton. That's that, that's that dangerous album length, because I do that same yeah. thing with albums about that long. So I've heard this album several, several times at this point. And then it just keeps growing on me, and it's just a lovely, lovely release. We're going to talk about a classic black metal record, because I didn't, couldn't think of anything to pick for this week. It's A Blaze in the Northern Sky by Dark Throne, released in 1991. That's wrong, probably. 92. Fuck, really? It was recorded in 91. Oh, yeah, recorded in 91, released in 92. You're right. Is a classic black metal record, one in the... Unholy Trinity entry, which are the three records from Dark Throne, which are considered to be some of the best black metal material of all time. I just like it a lot. That'd be fun to talk about. You know, it's a classic. Chaz is not familiar with this genre of music at all. So I just figured, I'd, you know, this is a good introduction. I would plan to do more on the show, just not in this vein. But anything's worth doing once. I love this record. I think it's fucking kick ass. It's easily my favorite black metal record because Dark Throne is a band that there's some <laughs> problematic viewpoints in the black metal scene. <laughs> Especially the Norwegian scene, where people were killed, and churches were burned, and there are lots of Nazis, and there still are. But Dark Throne are not Nazis, murderers, or arsonists. Not been convicted of, anyway. And we're never <laughs> accused of. There's no allegedly in that sentence, because they have never been accused of doing that. I think it's just a lot of people cosplaying Satanists in Dark Throne, which is a lot more fun. Makes it a lot more theatrical, which is a big element of black metal. Makes it a lot more, uh, you know, doesn't take away from the intensity of the playing that it is kind of a, you know, it's a little cringe. It's a little cringe. You know, overall, fantastic black metal record and a lot of nuance, even though the mixes are meant to be as rough as possible. I think the mix on this record is, you know, there's a little more to it and you got to kind of get accustomed to the sound. And that's a big hurdle for people getting into black metal for the first time. One that I have no doubt Chaz has cleared with no trouble at all. So should I go first? Yeah, before, no. And before you get I think, in, before you start getting into Let's let Chaz, that? you know, hit the finale, <laughs> okay, <laughs> basically. Okay. So metal is something we've hardly touched on the show. I'm going to fix that. Um, I'm, I aim to fix that. Have we done any metal records? Zeal before? and Ardor we've is the- We've talked about one black metal Zeal and Ardor, that was it. Episode three. That's the only thing 
black metal related thing we've ever that one's about black on metal show. like adjacent like there's black yes, metal in it yeah. that, that is a, a straight black metal record yeah this is straight up black metal like came out during second wave which is the most notorious you know the most praised from what i can see most praised era of the genre because it's kind of out of this formative stage and it's like here's this sound and of course here come all these records that are going to pave the way for every record that's going to sound exactly like them for 30 years right what? so at the time we talked about zeal and ardor and basically throughout the entirety of our first run of episodes i had barely heard any black metal maybe i had heard a couple birds and records i might have heard this record at the time i might have heard an emperor album or two very unaccustomed to black metal and just metal in general. But in the time that we've had, in the sort of year off from this show that we had, I've gotten a lot more into more extreme musics. So like I've heard a lot more black metal. I've even dabbled in death metal and grindcore and all that jazz. So I, I this feels less difficult for me to get into now. And it feels like I can finally appreciate the songwriting and I can finally look at music that has aggression and darkness as its primary atmosphere and actually get into it. Whereas before I really couldn't, I don't think I've become an angrier person. I just think I finally get the appeal of this kind of stuff. And yeah, as Brian said, I think this is one of the best dark, that dark metal, <laughs> dark one, of best, metal. Like, one of the best black metal records I have heard personally. It's not my absolute favorite in the genre, but I think that, especially for a beginner in the genre, the mix is noisy and cacophonous, but not so is, low fi that you can't tell what's going on. It's accessible for sure, as far as black yeah. metal goes. It's got some very prominent riffs uh, in the shadow of the horns, has an almost thrash metal-y kind of riff to it. The vocals are basically classic black metal screeches and horrible demon goblin <laughs> sound. I'm shaking! <laughs> Which I think just fit perfectly in the music it's because me. black metal is never about lyrics. You can never tell what they're saying. It's just Same never going to happen. It's the same thing with like death metal. We're all anything where the vocals are monstrous. Yeah, just fantastic songwriting all across this thing. And the performances are great. It's 42 minutes long and no song here drags, in my opinion. Um, it's super easy to listen to for me after having heard it a few times. I can just throw it on and just appreciate how loud and how aggressive and atmospheric this whole thing is. I don't have a whole lot more to say about it because, uh, I mean, it if just, you haven't heard a black metal record, this is a good one to start with. There's not a lot just, about to say about this that hasn't already been said, I think. Yeah, that's kind of the thing. I just like to, I just think the thing to appreciate about it more is, you know, in its accessibility, which is not a trait that's true of most black metal, right? And I mean, I mean it's, it's not fairly copy. It's, it's right, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're only. But if you liked thrash metal or death metal or something like that, and you wanted to get into the aesthetic of black metal, this would probably be. I mean, something you could try. I think there are riffs here that are catchy. They're maybe just like towards the back half of Pagan Winter, and the chord changes on the. Um... In the shadow of the horns. I was going to say the chords, yeah, on the Shadow of the Horns, it has those dissonant little melodies in the back, like the keys going on towards that track, too. This, the tracks just progress and change in a meaningful way. A Blaze in the Northern Sky, the title track, is also one that, oh, my God, the riffs are just, they're very thrash. Like, the, the take note, the roots of black metal, I mean, they are in thrash, but they're just so tasty. God, they're just, every time they come in, every time the change comes into that song and they start, oh, my God, it's just incredible. Like the last two songs of this album are like among some of my favorite black metal tracks is the new the little newbie that I am. But oh my god, they're just the last half of this record is just so killer. And it's all due to, you know, the songs just are dynamic. They change up and there's a little more to the mix once your ear gets adjusted, you know. It just goes to show that taking I think this mindset of like and it's whatever, it's you know, but just as a listener, like the mindset in black metal of like this is anti you know like it's supposed to be so anti and the further we can go you know anti what exactly not sure you know it's just very insular genre but i feel like this in the inception of it here with these dark records and perhaps other records in the genre you know it's fresh and that's why i feel like starting here is such a good point because you can see how over the years this sound has just been replicated over and over again and hasn't really been advanced upon purposefully hasn't been advanced, it's been advanced upon. upon quite a bit i think i think there's a lot well there's the emergence of, of like, records that have 
There's the emergence uh, of American black metal and black gaze and stuff. There's black gaze, but there's also black metal that flirts with industrial sounds and electronic. Like black Dungeon metal, Synth. Especially, right, well, Dungeon Synth's a pretty early <laughs> thing, too. But uh, I'm laughing about Dungeon Synth. These, these genre names. This show has brought to my attention some of the funniest genre names ever. And now I can add. It's accurate, though. I can add. Dungeon, I thought yeah. the same thing when I saw Dungeon Synth. I was like, "What kind of useless semantics is it?" But then you hear it, and you're like, "Ooh, man, no. I can add Dungeon Synth to the Black link. Metal. Yes. I think has been one of the most influential and popular metal genres among music nerds, maybe not at large, over the past couple decades. I mean, you saw it in bands like Deaf Heaven, just blowing up in the indie sphere by combining the most indie head genre of all time, shoegaze, to black metal and caused a huge amount of controversy because you have all the people who were fans of his stuff back in the 90s or uh, fans of, uh, you know, there's just a lot of, it, it's a lot more <laughs> far reaching than it used to be. It's a lot less insular. There is a section of black metal and it's a vocal minority kind of thing I'm, I'm sure but it's just that they can't change it has to stay the same it's been this and the purpose of it staying they don't realize that they're just caught up in worthless traditionalism but you know whatever i guess that's i hope it's a stage <laughs> like you know because it's just very stupid <laughs> it is stupid it is you're gonna make stupid. you're gonna make so many people like who cares like, no one's gonna listen to this right but if a bunch of like big fucking like burzum fans who hate Heaven. I have no fear of the yeah. keyboard warriors of you know just they're You're pussies. Like the <laughs> they're not you know whatever they're all pussies. It's a good out al- Dark Throne. It's a good album. I don't know you know I don't know a whole lot about the other ones, but I you know why just be so close minded about something you like? You know it has to say the same. You know it, it, it's very stupid. You don't have to like it if they change it, but I'm just saying you know just disagreeing with the idea of change on GP is ridiculous. Chaz, you like Dark Throne? This album sucks. Let Here me- we have the Weezer fan in his natural environment. Yeah. <laughs> used to a black metal record. Not like oh, this. Oh, he comes a little cold. It's just like, like Chaz this. is like a deer, just like a deer in a field wearing like a button up shirt. <laughs> and there's just a leopard wearing corpse paint, <laughs> like in some tall grass, <laughs> waiting off to the side. Oh, shit. Look, I'll be real with you. I think black metal, death metal, is cringy as shit. (laughs) Especially especially death metal. I had a lot of friends growing up who loved that shit, and I just thought they were posers. Like, I legit was like, why is this what you gravitate towards? It's so (laughs) I'm waiting for you to tell me, like, they listen to Limp Bizkit, and that's, like, your idea of death metal. (laughs) (laughs) No, no, I couldn't name you any death metal. I couldn't name you any death metal groups. I just know the sound. A lot of scream. One of them is called Death. Like death metal, screamo, that kind of stuff. Yeah, a lot of that. Screamo is like an, a punk type. It's thing. like an offshoot Screamo's of very different. Nah, yeah. I think when you think I of get death more metal, metal you than... might be thinking of like the shitty two thousands melodic death metal. Anyway, how dare you? So when you pick Zeal and Ardor, I actually like that a lot. I think I gave it a seven. Because that, but that one is elements of black metal. Yes, it used the best things about black metal in this gospel aesthetic, (laughs) and it really. Go ahead. What did I just say? Something controversial? I just thought it was funny. It takes the best parts of black metal, like the blast beats. (laughs) (laughs) And I think you liked it more because they were playing blast beats for about thirty seconds, and then you, you know, the first song on this is uh, pretty long. I mean, it's like a ten minute track. I mean, it's pretty huge. Fucking minutes. (laughs) It's not my favorite song Look, either. I let mean, me, if that makes you feel better. The best thing about this album is the lyrics, hands down. Everything They're else... really theatrical, for sure. Everything else... How did you call it cringy, and then you say the lyrics are the best part? What's cringy is the sound, and the playing, and the aesthetic of it is fucking obnoxious. <laughs> let me describe to you what listening to this was like. I put it on... And we get this really cool intro of like this uh, monk kind of throat choir intro. It's It's really cool and ominous. And then it's ruined by this golem sounding gargling bastard. 
Oh, dude. Coming I knew, in. I knew the first 14 <laughs> seconds would determine whether or not you like this album. I told you when we recorded last yeah. time, I was like, you will know in about 14 seconds if you like this album. Comes in and just throws me for a loop, and I'm like, okay. And then he says, Blaze of a Northern Sky, and then the music starts, and immediately, I don't take it seriously. Immediately, like, done. Nope, not for me. I don't think get, you, uh... Get the I shit mean, out of here. that's part of the... Did you try to take it seriously, or were you just like, yeah, I don't... Because I don't take it seriously. Well, like, you it was know? a little like, bit of I, both. Like, that's... It was a little bit well, of both. Well, I don't take... I don't take the lyrics seriously, I should yeah. say. I think the music is, you know... Well, no, no. Right. Let me explain. I think the lyrics are the best thing because they induct a lot of very interesting imagery, visual imagery. The lyrics just are really cool. I don't know how to describe it, but just what they're talking about. I just see, like, Vikings and, you know, embracing the the harsh seas and, and like fighting skeletons and shit like, I don't know. I just get like a cool metal vibe from it. However, it's all fucking ruined because the playing, the production, the vocals are trash. Absolute trash. I fucking hate the production on this album. I can't hear a goddamn thing. This guy is saying, the vocals are ruined for me because I can't understand him. What <laughs> so ever? I knew. I knew. I told Brian. I was like, Chaz is going to come in and say something. He's like, I can't tell what he's saying on this black metal record. Well, like, <laughs> what's the appeal of that? Why should I even care about the lyrics if I can't understand a fucking word he's saying? And I can try all day. <laughs> Unless I have the genius dot com lyrics in my face cannot understand a fucking word this guy says yeah i mean you would never it's ruined. Under, yeah you would never i mean that's why they they put them on the line June, notes as well what is so that's, appealing that's about that point. what is so appealing about that it might as well be instrumental like there's no point of having lyrics if i can't hear them i don't i'm just hearing he needs to go listen to burza that's just that's all i'm hearing steal his music yeah I, that's all i hear is just you know he would like burza more that's all i'm just, getting from i know it's serious like it's a legit genre that's been around and it's developed over time it doesn't matter. Gimmicky. It sounds gimmicky as fucking hell because just the the aesthetic, the imagery, complete turnoff for me. I don't understand. I think it's just opinion. really funny that you're like, it's cringy and it's gimmicky. I love the lyrics that make me think about skeletons and Vikings fighting. Because that shit's cringe. cool. <laughs> Super cringe sound. It's the sound. No, it's the sound of playing. It's cool to us. It's cool to me and you. I don't know many Stacys that would, you know, that's maybe that, look, the... <laughs> I can get that it's a lot at first, and honestly, the gimmicky critique, I'm kind of surprised to hear just because, you know, I could see that critique coming out the more black metal you listen to, I think. Well, the first, I couldn't, the first I, note, know. the first note, and then he st screams, and I'm like, yeah, here we go. Like, it just sounds like a parody of itself, and this is one of the first of the genre. Like, that's just how, I think that's why I don't is, care for this genre. I never like, have liked this sound before. You know, I think it's very atmospheric as part of it. You know, it's you relate to it on a very in, primal level, I think, when you're for me anyway, like when I'm listening to it, like it's just like the way they're playing, the way it sounds, you know, because it's purposely very rough recording. And somehow black metal, the thing that's so unique about it, it hit this. They're playing in a different way and the, they're exploring these different rough tones and, you know, how you can use them to create an atmosphere and the atmosphere they create. That's the most unique thing about black metal to me. This total emotional appeal in the music. That's the thing. You know, it only gets atmospheric for me in the first 10 seconds and the last 10 seconds of the album. Everything else in between is just noise. It's just noise. I don't think it is. I think that's a wrong... I think well, that the critique, playing is fine. I, like, I like the energy and sound. Mm. Of, like, I do like how the guitars and drums are very low in the mix. Like It's kind of cool, but it just really starts to become one note to me. Like, every song sounds the same here on me. And obviously, it, it, just, it isn't, because if you really listen, there's a lot of different things happening. But I'm just so distracted by how bad the vocals are that I'm not paying attention to the instrumental. It's because the vocals are super low in the mix. Like, under, they're just buried underneath That's what pisses everything. me off, though. I Because, I, like I said, the thing I like most about this is the fun lyrics and cool imagery that it, like, makes you see. But I can't hear it, so I'm just trying. To me, like, if the lyrics were, like, evoking an image, I just, the cover is a pretty good, this is, like, one of my favorite album covers, because I just think it's so indicative of what the album is. And it really does just sound someone, like, screaming through this, like, blizzard or something. Like, that's the first thing I think of. Mm -hmm. um, 
this this hellish it, that's really a good word to describe it too this completely hellish like sound but also like you know i think the roots of thrash are very much here especially on that second half of pagan winter the closing track like that is super thrash metal you could throw that into a fucking metallica song and it wouldn't sound out of place like it's a straight up thrash riff and that's true for the last half of blaze in the northern sky too that's on that song as well i i don't know if the sound is doing it just go listen to the fucking record but like they're groovy as well like that's what i like about this record between all the blasting drums and stuff like that you're getting um unique little bits that make the song stand apart and they stand apart on their own anyway because they do transition beautifully like on the second track where you get these really dissonant keys in the background towards the end of that track too i just think the progression on this album and the way it's written and the mix these things are purposely mixed you know they're supposed to have a like bad or harsh sound you know which i'm sure for the time was kind of a thing but i you know i'm just it's you know i'm a zoomer it's too late i've heard the worst shit you know what i mean so like it doesn't really bother me to me the mixing on this one you know my ears not as trained as others i think they went out of their way to do a little more production on this one than they would have you know uh, I mean, these are these are studio sessions. You know, this is not like record it, we're done. Like this was engineered. You know, for a black metal record, it's pretty produced. And I think that just you know taking it to that point, but still maintain that rough sound is what just keeps this thing so awesome to the ears. It's just you can come back and hear new things in the mix. They're not the vocals are maybe buried a little bit, but you can still you can hear them if you're really listening. You can hear those keyboards come in if you know your ear catches them, and you can focus on different parts of the music, and it's not muddy the mix is rough but it's not muddy and that's what's really important to me everything here is not got a sugary sweet perfect sound like to studio it's just they understand they did a really good job at picking volumes for the different instruments in the mix and making them appropriate for each part of the song and also you know making sure that it, it was still you know you're still able to pick apart these elements while they also enhance each other at the same time and that's like the trick of production really is is trying to make the thing stand out that you want to stand out and you know maybe some things are lower in the mix some sounds you won't even catch on first listen you may and you know you'll catch them on maybe 12th listen or something ridiculous like that but they're purposefully there to enrich the song even if you don't hear them and you don't know they're doing it at first that's and that's the like the beauty of this record that's the issue i'll never listen to this again i don't care this is a genre that i've always had bias towards and this just solidified it we're going back i mean we're going back I mean, I'm happy that you guys get a lot out of it, and I can understand why it's gained such a following and has produced a lot more different genres in similar veins. That's super cool. For me, it's always just been gimmicky and not something that I ever just really want to listen to. You can well, meme, you you know, can meme me all you want. Strong four, strong four on Dark Throne, <laughs> Blaze in the Northern Sky. Well, that's the beauty of the show. Is get you know, that golem throat and, singing and out of this. my face. We can fix you, Chaz. Yeah, Don't worry. We're fix you. You know, maybe I got another black metal pick coming up for the show. Oh, but fuck. It's not. Um, well, you know what? It's not a classic by any means. It's a very. It's a personal favorite. Well, here's um, the thing. Personal favorite. It'll always be the pattern. Brian will pick some industrial metal bullshit that I'll never get, <laughs> and I'll pick some ambient. <laughs> instrumental bullshit that Brian will never you get. You will get me, with, but you're going to win me with the ambient thing at some point. You are, you are, everything and I'll be the winner. <laughs> you're gonna, you're, you'll are gonna, you get me at some point. That's the point of the show. I'll never listen to that shit on my own. So Chaz, like, listen to it and we have to talk about it. You know, I can't fuck around and listen to it the morning of. You know what I mean? Yeah. I respect you. So, the, like, point I, of the, you know. show, the point of a show is that June has the best taste. Not really. June, right, Chaz, hey, June sometimes oh, you come in with it, some yeah. underproduced twee pop bullshit that both me and Brian are like, get this out of here. Life without buildings. Fuck yeah, you. yeah, I get. <laughs> oh, oh, I, I love that. I love that take totally, so much. June, what totally, do you think of Dark Throne? Put a number on Dark Throne. Put a number on the wrong art. eight, but do not disparage Life Without Buildings. <laughs> I light nine on Dark Throne. Easily one of my favorite black metal records. Honestly, what's been coming back to the show is just deeper appreciation for things as I come back. Mm -hmm. All right. This has been Unwarranted Music Opinions. Next week is going to be another regular episode where we can choose whatever we want. And I have decided to go with an easy pick, an easy classic, well-known band and album, and one of my favorites. But I just really, really wanted to get them on the show and talk about them. We're going to do the album Treasure by Cocteau Twins. Oh, shit. 
it's time. I've heard this a long it's time, time ago. It's time to talk about Cocteau Twins. Damn. They mean quite it's... a big deal to me. All right, here we go. I wasn't ready for that shit. My pick sucks. Uh, I'm going to pick... Oh, I'm torn. I'm really torn. The pick I was originally going to go with is super ambitious. Is super, like, is really conceptual. Let's ease in. We're going to ease in with Mount Erie's Lost Wisdom. We're just going to ease into this artist and try to understand the sound a little bit. Try to understand the core sound of Phil Elvram's uh, little solo venture, and then we'll kind of jump around the discography a little bit. I plan to use a few sequels episodes for this across the life of the show. So, you know, we'll, we will definitely come back to this discography a lot because it's one of my favorites. You know, this is one of the artists where one of the very few where I've heard almost all the discography at this point. So, you know, it's worth going back to over and over again, but we need to start somewhere that is not necessarily chronological, just is going to be easiest to just get into. We're just going to go with Lost Wisdom. Very smooth, gentle album just to get into it. It's time to get more Vaporwave on this show. Last time we talked about Vaporwave was the classic Floral Shop by Macintosh Plus that went over a lot better than I thought it was going to. It actually made it up. Or no, it made it on your top 10, June, uh, yeah. number 10. It was my number 10. That yeah. will forever be a big moment for me for the show. So while that artist is considered to be like the pioneer of the genre, the artist we're going to be talking about is Saint Pepsi, who is one of the artist that came out of vaporwave like that brought the genre to more of a mainstream i think really uh brought it into the forefront his flair is all about funk music he actually is one of the pioneers of the genre sub genre of vaporwave future funk which is very interesting and we're going to do his 2013 classic hit vibes this has been unwarranted music opinions i'm june Lindberg, and i was here with brunchy Crunchy. That was bad. That was terrible. And Claude Jeffries. Even worse, somehow. Spoon Tint Brog. No, bad. <laughs> All terrible. And we'll Goodbye. see you next time. Thanks yeah. for listening. <laughs> Let's get out of here. Run. <laughs>